Predeterminism. Free will. Devs. Bow. Blood everywhere. That was what I want. That was my bit. That's what you. So you've been doing musical bits for uh-huh. a few, for a few bit, but they are all just Final Fantasy VII battle music. <laughs> yeah, I did the bit. Well, my bit was just. It sh- <laughs> actually, it's funny because the bit in my head was a Mortal Kombat style approach to devs. But you did the. But I instinctively did the. That's just because that's what I'm playing right now. So that's yeah. No, you know, more power to you. I'm glad that you're here and excited. We need a little excitement these days. You know what I mean? I can't, uh, I mean, there's a lot of excitement. I would say these days. <laughs> Or do you mean excitement in a positive sense? There's a lot in of a neutral excitement, way. like big things. I mean, that's happening. like a positive, like di- yeah, frame rate, yeah, positivity. It is frame yeah. rate. Mm-hmm. I'm Michael we Swain. Frames. Oh shit! Shit. We'll separate that out in post. But just in case we don't, <sighs> I'm Michael Swain. I'm Abe Epperson. And this is frame rate where we rate frames. Mm. The Triumphs of it's Swain. Kind of a special case. Should have done that in a different order. Yeah, it's a Venus content module. Because um, we were like, hey. Yeah. We were both talking about this when we were playing some video games. Nothing and excites like, a small bean's weenus quite like a mm-hmm. content module that's Venus. And that's how we say bonus around these parts. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So what I mean by that is it's a bonus frame rate. And I don't, I'm bringing this up in real time now, but I think maybe it should be, uh, you know, patron only, at least for a while. What do you think? Yeah, why not? Fuck it. Well, not fuck it. It would be nice if we, (laughs) you know, got some new people on on board the bean train. Was my thing, but yeah. Oh, okay. In that case. Oh, business success? Sure. Fine then. Hell yeah. Um, Fuck it. But yeah, we're here to, I guess we're predetermined to do what we're going to do because we both watch devs. Devs now available streaming on something, I forget. Hulu? FX on FX Hulu. On Hulu. I, think, I think the point is it was an FX. Mm-hmm. They put it on Hulu. Now I think you can watch it on Amazon Prime or something. I'm sure you can, but it's D-E-V-S, maybe, find maybe. it. Uh, and it's notable, often we don't cover TV on this, on this uh, little audio program, but it is very finite. By the way, is it a miniseries? Was that the end? It's, it feels it's like it has to be. It's a miniseries, yeah. That's done. It is a yeah. eight-episode miniseries by Alex Garland, creator of Annihilation, Ex Machina, mm-hmm. writer of 28 Days Later, producer and writer of Dread. We've mm-hmm, talked about mm-hmm, him a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm a real big fan. He's Mike's earning really garlands right now. He is yeah. a uh, an up and coming. I would say like up and came if it wasn't so gross sounding. But he's. Uh, uh, yeah. I guess I would say I don't yet quite. I I put him with Ari Aster. I don't worship at the altar of him. Altar, like yeah. I am not. I'm not uh, absolutely one thousand percent sure he's historically notable and will be for all time. But he has a shot at that. At being a Coen mm-hmm. Brothers or uh, even a Wes Anderson, who I whether it's your favorite or not, I think will be historically notable or uh, whatever Coppola, you know what I mean. Um, but mm-hmm. he's he is like really killing it in this early part of his career, early to mid part of his career, uh, mm-hmm. and this is his first crack at TV. And because we've covered, well, you recently covered Dread on Director Piece, and mm-hmm. uh, we've covered. We're going to cover Ex Machina soon, and we have covered Annihilation. And all of these movies, we have lots of stuff to say about, and you should listen to those things. But um, but all in all, all of them, both of us would agree, are like good, better than bad. They're good and smart good. and worth unpacking. And we both yeah. watched devs and just were like, we should probably do them emergency frame rate on devs right Mm. so much like we did uh when black panther came out because we thought it was such a notable event in film canon uh we think devs is pretty cool and it got us excited so we were like bonus frame rate time and we broke the glass and we pulled the lever and now Mm. it's now we're here we went down our little shoots that lead us into the podcast space which means there will be spoilers for devs if Mm. such a thing can even be said to exist because I guess, well, it's if it already happened. Right. What is a spoiler if time is just a statue that we're viewing? I a have piece a question of time? for you. Yeah, let's talk devs. Go. If you lived in a world where every single thing 
down from like a blade of grass to the wide ranges of emotions and like complexities of um personalities let's say you, like things you interact with behave exactly in accordance to what you've perceived up to this moment mm -hmm. about the world but you knew with an absolute certainty that everything that exists was a part of a computer simulation would that change how you live or change how you react to anything that the world threw at you well, it reminds me of that movie Fearless, right? Where the guy gets the fear center of his brain shut down mm -hmm. somehow. I forget how. Mm -hmm. um, or he's in a plane wreck or something and he has no fear. Uh, would, yeah, don't you think? For, yeah. Well, I wonder because you would still, like, you still perceive pain, right? People in the Matrix, you still perceive the pain. So it's still like, it doesn't Love matter that you know well. it's a simulation. Joy. But I guess I feel like in subtle ways, you would have to start exhibiting more risk-taking behavior and we kind of see that in devs i mean alex garland and this is one of my minor gripes with him i think he does tend to get away with a lot by using inscrutable characters like for example stewart's decision mm -hmm. at the end you have to decide why why stewart decided to essentially vote for predeterminism by killing the character anyway even when she miraculously wasn't going to die um and I think that points to a tactic Alec Garland uses, which is he is very obviously concerned with the limits of human comprehension. And he uses that as a way to allow himself to be like, I don't have to answer that because it's the limits. I mean, we're dealing with things that are beyond human comprehension. Yeah. I can't answer every aspect. Or he I'd also be God. wants to be nimble in his answer. He's like, oh, did I do that? You know, like he's, right. he does the thing, like in terms of Stuart, you can believe that uh, the world is predeter uh, predetermined and ordered. And just like his namesake, he's essentially just a guardian of that principle. Mm -hmm. Or you can consider him moved by uh, like the, the trials that basically went basically like f fucked over his friend's life and that caused him to be like you know no oh Lyndon um, you mean you think that you can't came from... you can't do that to Lyndon he was the only one that I connected with and he was right and he was right and you you did him dirty and this is this is what's going gonna happen now it's like so, if uh, Steve <clears throat> Jobs pushed uh, Wozniak off a bridge <laughs> it's like but he invented more like it Woz you prick pushed Steve Jobs but yeah Oh, well, I think a lot of nerds like myself consider Waz to be the real creator who got ripped off. But either way, yeah, you get the you get the analogy. Yeah. No, no, I think you're right. I'm just saying I'm saying that like Forrest is Steve Jobs in that. In that's analogy. true. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's it's because he's so he's so driven uh, and there's a lot of messianic stuff going on. I think the reason I open that question is I think that at the end of the day, when we examine this, and I hope to think uh, that this is how people examine it, it's not about the, you know, kind of infinite lists that we can make about like, well, what does this symbolize? Well, forest, forest and lily are both, both flora and fauna, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. What does that mean? You know, these are, these can be interesting. The symbology can be interesting, but I think he is positing that question, uh, to all of us because it's kind of at the heart of predeterminism. And I think it is an interesting suggestion to update it and put it in a computer simulation to like ask the question. And if nothing was different, but you knew everything was different, in that certain way that that question is phrased, does it really influence what you do? Right. It, don't you just operate anyway as if you're trying to be the best little Abe that you could be? You know, like, uh, and I feel like that's a very valid question. If you as can't we, wake up, if your only recourse is the simulation, you may as well just do your best anyway. It's not like there's mm -hmm. anything else to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, <laughs> I guess it's because maybe I am maybe I, because I'm fairly agnostic in my principles and I think uh I don't necessarily believe in predetermination. I actually think that it's a lot more chaotic to have free will. But like if you were to consider that things are to be destined because everything has an answer, 
like those mo- that molecule was always supposed to be that way that mm-hmm. atom was always supposed to be that way at this time at this time because all these influences um and that randomness doesn't exist i mean that's a huge thing in this uh, in devs right is the allison pill basically uh you know, taking it to Lily and asking, like, name one random thing. Name literally right, one random thing. Right, and it's also thing. the basic question that um, if it is implied by, because we recently covered predestination, which is another word for predeterminism, and it's yeah. funny how similar the concepts they're wrapped around are, which is basically the idea that time travel, even v- time travel, that's a vision because they don't travel physically through time till arguably mm-hmm. the end. Although they're traveling to adjacent universes that are at different points in time, whatever you consider time travel, it gets messy. But my point mm-hmm. being, if time travel exists, it kind of implies there's no free will or time travel's useless. They can't both be, because it is that question. Well, if time travel exists and you can see what will happen, wouldn't that change what you would do if you saw yourself getting hit by a car or your house Mm -hmm. burning down because you left the burner on? Wouldn't you not leave it on? And dramatically, I think as a testament to the fact that we don't actually know what the answer to that conundrum is, or even if it has objective meaning, uh, they, they land... Somewhere that I really like, and this is somewhere I think Alex Garland shines, which is that he uses a plethora of tactics, not just one tactic. So there's, so for example, like I would think a lesser show or a lesser team would, uh, the scene we were talking about where Lyndon teeters on the bridge, uh, Mm -hmm. shows the multiverse theory visually in a visual metaphor by having him, you know, like multiple iterations of him tumbling through the air and I think a lesser show would have done that constantly, you know, like 10 times in the eight episodes. Whereas I love that they uh, invented a multitude of ways to basically diagrammatically show what they're talking about because it's somewhat complex. And they landed the only other like story that I'm familiar with that uses this same sort of feel is Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen, which Mm -hmm. is there's a famous I mean, and it's a question that just as a human, I think that is the sticking point for us metaphysically because I when reading Watchmen I was like begging a character to ask Dr. Manhattan this and finally someone does which is but why did you act surprised then in that one scene when you found out something don't you know everything I don't understand and he says well I know everything that will happen and I saw that at that moment when you give me that information I'm surprised by it so I was and she goes I don't understand how that can be true how those things are mutually exclusive and he's like I know you don't understand and I think Alex Garland plays it a very similar way Uh, and I I like that incident where it's like is her name Katie? Alice? who's the uh, Uh, deadpan Katie Katie Katie, Katie. the right hand man of Offerman Uh, on that when she says well to Lyndon he goes, well, do I fall? And she's like, I unfortunately saw what I say to you, including the sentence I'm speaking now, and I don't tell you. Yeah, it's it's very... And sl- the question you ask is, well, could you? And it posits, uh, ultimately, mm-hmm. Dev's major spoiler, it comes down on the side of essentially, she could have, but if she did, it would have created a, di- a whole different dimension. And who knows if her identity, that iteration of it, which dimension it would even inhabit. They don't really get Mm -hmm. into definitive answers on that. My question for you was in that scene, before we move on from that one scene, which I really loved when every version of Lyndon falls, does that mean that even in the multiverses, he always fell like his time was out in a macro cosmic sense. Do you think, is there no that's, universe where that's he didn't the fall? Question. Okay, so you have to look at the principle of Lily, and if you, Lily is unique, because that's the other question: is Lily unique? Is Lily Jesus? Because, <laughs> because if you think of her as not unique, then I think you we are only left with information that uh, that resolves in yes, he, there would be some like a meteor would fall and hit them or something like, or hit him or something like that. Or some, some crazy random circumstance would occur because if you don't see Lily as unique, you, we have been proven that things are predetermined. And even though she fought against in the final, like uh, la- second, to last scene uh, and she threw the gun away and she said, here I am no more gun. She did exactly what you did to Dr. Manhattan. 
if she is not unique, that means everyone has is just plain. I can't buy that, or it would have happened thousands of years earlier. She has to be unique. The story's built she, around. Okay, like, if someone could have done that earlier, they would have. I think that's what that's what he's saying. And I mean, of course, that's a metaphor for. I think if you were to ask Garland, he'd probably be like, yeah, we're all Jesus, though. <laughs> you know, like, or I guess she's not Jesus. She's you. Uh, she's, it's not important. Yeah, that she's you. She it doesn't she. matter. But yeah, 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 yeah. And so, if she is unique, that means that now we have the ability to see that time, uh, time and space can fight back, or destiny can fight back, and find other solutions. But uh, you know, at any point. Um, she, she is the one who could actually ask the question for some other reason, just like how we perceive other people. Uh, if let's say this, whether or not this is a simulation doesn't matter, but Michael Swaim just responds to me and I only perceive things as Abe Epperson. So you are reading a script in my opinion, you know, like I can think of that. Mm -hmm. Think of it that way because I'm not coming to those words. Now, obviously, I don't think I'm unique, so it kind of cuts both ways. Um, I do love the part where like, Nick Offerman talks about, like, it's funny how I can still feel the neural impulses bubbling up as I say the words I've seen myself say before. Mm -hmm. It really feels like I'm thinking of them right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. And I think that it always, I think that that's. That's why I don't think predeterminism exists, but uh, the very concept of being able to determine stuff and then preemptively have like some because like that's the kind of thing that they did it early on with Sergey, right? He he started down the rabbit hole because he could preemptively determined a very simple organism's like next behavior based off pattern recognition, mm. but pattern recognition is only. Like I can, if, even if I can get you to a 99.9% .9 degree because you're super simple, like you usually go for the food. So if I drop food in, I'm going to, it's going to go toward the food or something like that. Like I can create predictive situations, predictive simulations yeah. in order to get increased accuracy or in another way of saying it, you know, like I, I have observed the, uh, you know, um, experiment, therefore I've altered it. That's um, the sticking point because I think, well, that's why he mentions it has to be 100% or it's nothing because like you said, the universe is on an infinite time and space scale. So right, if you so have a 0.001% it, impurity, it, it can't predict like, shit. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's too much. It's um, too much now. And I think the other thing you just dropped, which is totally seems true as far as we know, and it's ironic that he has limitless funds because his company owns the patent on quantum computing mm -hmm. because... The fundamental like underlying realities of quantum computing are kind of what disprove predeterminism, which is a which I think is intentional because that's a tension you see when yes. Nick Offerman doesn't only wants the version of the interpretation that makes it not his fault his daughter died to be the scientific answer. And that's there's a nice little arc. I would call it a relatively simple arc by Alex Garland's standards, but it's a nice arc where it's like he has to confront that scientific reality doesn't conform to what you wanted it to be, just literally mm -hmm. like the hypothesis process. But you also mentioned that it turns out, and we're pretty sure about this at this point, that... Um, Everything's connected, and by that I mean you. We only ex we're a soup. It seems like there's space between things, but there really isn't. You only perceive things because light physically enters your eyeball. You only smell things because poo particles right. from my butt farting literally go in yeah. your nose. Get, Sorry, your butt gets in my nose. <laughs> um, the air has to vibrate physically against your eardrum. Blah blah blah. And if you take that down to the micro scale, what we're essentially saying is. You exist, and literally by virtue of that fact, you can't do anything, including things you think of as passive, like observing. All I did was look that you're part of the system now. So how yeah. there's no way we can ever detach from reality because we are made of it. Therefore, I don't see how there could be, if even if there is predeterminism, 
how could you ever view the future? Because you wouldn't know if it's the real future because viewing it like we just, it creates recursive loops so quickly and little mm. impurities in the time stream. It just seems impossible. But fun story. <laughs> fun story. And I do yeah, like, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, I think that there's, I think he kind of preempted for this because he, he brought up, there's only a few things that's brought up in this story. And what I love about the, the small, uh, limited series kind of, um, aspect about this is that there's only a few arcs that can be developed. And one of the ones that he developed is, uh, surveillance, not just of the company and its people, but also of the outside world and what I guess I'm calling unforeseen unseen forces. Like, um, and I'm namely talking about the spy arc. Uh, and yeah. I think that the and spy arc fake. adds the little, deep yeah, fake exactly. Detail. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a reason that he did that specifically because he could have chosen any number of things. It seems to fit nice with tech, you know, and the idea of what what's going on in the world Russian right now in terms of operatives, Russian yeah. bots, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I thought that the surveillance aspect was uh, notably important only because of what we're talking about right now, which is that your observation, like, um, like is if we're to take a very, you know, United States American centric viewpoint and say at the beginning this story let's say is being told by americans about america and we're all like you and i are both american the audience so, is american too so yeah. let's perceive that we're the main character even though of course we're not and um if the we're the subject of the experiment then the uh, uh, the entire other world is the one who could be a part of that experiment by mere fact of people seeing how our experiment is running they have changed it just by uh, observing and detailing it and they don't even have to break it or do anything malicious because that's something i thought that was specifically uh, garland and company didn't do they didn't have the with the exception of killing um uh, Kenton, like they didn't do anything to alter the experiment. They were just trying to find out what it was. Yeah. And arcs so often with arcs in this particular case would so often turn into, uh, well then the, the Russians did it. So now they're a player in this, you know, kind of thing. The reserve, the reservation that, um, Garland had in this regard is kind of impressive to take from a story of like right now he's making this thing about Russian spies about tech and doing his little fiction and he chooses them not to do anything for like state reasons they're just investigating and then at one point a one man who's just working on the job the uh the homeless guy yeah. oh it never occurs he, to anyone ever he, to use time travel to like win the war for american interest the scope of what they're no. worried about is so much grander than that who mm -hmm. cares if there is a russian spy beyond the fact that it impacts lily our character that we care about but like yeah i like that and i you can tell that garland is not the type to escalate it into like now she's gonna use the ability of free will to stop the Russian invasion. And you're like, it's not about that. It's not about it's, that. It's, yeah. well, time it's and time about again, scientific done... process and finding things out. That's what he likes. That's what he writes And avoiding about. kind of the zeitgeist take, um, which I think is keeps his sh shit fresh. Yeah, he you know um, I mean? he's totally consistent with like that TNG voice that we think is missing a lot. I do think Alex Garland is someone doing hard sci-fi, essentially, that yeah. has action elements but doesn't depend upon the climax being like uh, like Live, Die, Repeat, a.k.a. Edge of Tomorrow, where it, mm. it's funny, the whole first part is like a cool Philip K. Dick time loop mind fuck, and then the end I kind of feels tacked on because it's like, now he has to use the time loop ability to kill all the aliens, you know, just because we got to wrap this thing up. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex and Garland... got to end it with a bang. Alex Garland continues impresses by just going no 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 
the thing that we're thinking about, that's the show. Just think about that. Isn't that trippy, mm-hmm. man? That's that's yeah. the show. You that is the climax. Um I think let's go to yeah. let's go to fucking Santa Cruz and smoke a bowl, man. Like that's Oh, he totally is Cruz. though. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean I don't know if he smokes, but all of his plots Annihilation's even easier, but even Ex Machina's like a <laughs> robot, but the dude's like a freak, man. But she's even lying to the other dude, dude. It's all robots, dude. Is whoa, whoa, he whoa. even human? Maybe he's a robot, dude. <laughs> Am I dead a robot? Am I dead a robot? What even is a robot? Am I a robot yeah. right now? My hands seem like robots. Uh, Take off my skin, yo. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know. That's Alex Garland in a nutshell. But uh, <laughs> I also yeah. think, uh, and I think this is actually good and speaks to his, his craftsmanship and will will help him in a way that I'm pleased with. Annihilation is dense in a way where you have to want to crack it and figure it out. Ex Machina mm. less so. Annihilation is kind of the pinnacle of that. And I think you and I both noted, one of the first things we noted is, he knows it's TV and he knows the difference between TV and film. There Mm -hmm. were occasionally times where I, for my personal taste, it was even a little too training wheelsy and, or the plot elements, the plot beats were spaced out to give you lots of time to follow what's going on Uh, Mm -hmm. more than I needed. But the whole time I understood I was in good hands and I knew that Alex Garland was almost like a, like a math teacher Going like, I know you've got it, but hold on. I really want everyone in the class to get it before we mm. move on to the next subject. And he, right. he didn't That's belabor funny. it too much, but like compared to Annihilation, yeah, it's it's clear. It's like very open source. It's very like TV where everything's kind of answered. Um, even though there's a fundamental question or questions at the end, they're very easy questions to ask. Whereas I'd say Annihilation and Ex Machina, there's... There's so many big questions that you're not sure which ones um, to start with. And I think it's really the matter. It's not a matter of the scope of the question. It's the matter of the ambiguity of the morality at at display. There are very moral, morally uh, specific and like Forrest is immoral. (laughs) You know, like he (laughs) is a bad guy. At least amoral. Yeah. Well, and he knows what Ken's doing, and he they keep giving themselves the same excuse. Well, mm-hmm. we know that there's no free will, so you can't blame me for right. anything. Right. In Ex Machina, it's not as morally cut and dry. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, He actually talked to... Um, he had an interview. I think it was a Rolling Stone interview or it was an IndieWire interview, where he talked about why he did this uh, and jumped from uh, film to television. And I was actually very, uh, I was very sad to hear, and I hope it's not the trend, but um, he clearly has this opinion. He says, quote, on a more human personal level, my filmmaking career has been, I've made something, I've given it to a distributor, and they say, we don't want to distribute this. He added, uh, adding as soon as he turns to in his work, it feels like, quote, I've already disappointed someone. Ouch. So he, I think it's, he's been, he, he's felt like he's always been ignored. It looks like, and uh, we can take a look at the box office and the distribution deals that he's getting. He, well, not a lot of people are very excited in, in the frameworks of like the 2014, 2018, you know, when his bigger f- features came out, um, they even a 24, no, it's like Oscar winning perhaps, but there's, they're not really s- trying to sell I don't hear money internationally. In <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so when it comes down to it, he jumped to FX cause I think, uh, he said he, he was like the scope and the scale were very attractive. In other words, it would take a lot less money. Right. And he all he wants to do is do tell his want. dang stories, have people enjoy them. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And they're, the budget is used super well visually. You've never seen Nick Offerman turn in a performance like this. And it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, I gotta, I gotta say, I kind of don't always jibe with the super low energy direction style. Alex Garland has like Ventress basically acts a lot like Alice who acts a lot like literally the robot from Ex Machina. He loves Mm -hmm. uh, women who Mm -hmm. only speak like this. 
Uh, yeah, and I, like- uh, I, I think it's it makes more sense in devs because people who have seen the future, I buy that as a storytelling trope. Because they'd be shook. They're depressed yeah. now. Or like things don't seem like a big deal. You can go, the house is burning down and they go, it's okay. Like fucking whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's kind of like... The yeah. paranoid android, you know. But I will say I was waiting for those punctuation moments. Like I was waiting for Kenton to do something really intense and awful. Or I was waiting for Lily or the guy she ends up with whose name I also forget. Jamie. Jamie, thank you, to uh, have an emotional moment. Because I think Alex Garland can do. He shows a lot of empathy and he always makes sure to involve human elements to the weaving of the storytelling. Uh, for my money, he directs a little cold heartedly, like almost Kubricky, who also mm-hmm. I think has a detached style of direction, and it's fine. Some people love that. Uh, I, it creates a very definite tone that I get. Um, but so, but I like I like lots of energy and like mm-hmm. fluctuation in the emotional tone. But uh, but man, the, the budget he had, the visuals just I loved how spare and minimalist and yet sci-fi they were. Like just the simple rings around the trees. Or like mm. the recurring <clears throat> shots that have that square Very, shape that is the box. Because ultimately... Or the Amaya statue. The Amaya that statue, thing. yeah. It's very monolithic, the imagery, and like well chosen. I, I love the way the Amaya statue can look good or evil or happy or pensive or sad, mm. depending on how they light mm. it. But I loved, I kept noticing that as it develops into essentially a Farnsworth Parabox situation... Where mm-hmm. Stewart says, like, there's a box inside this box with everything in it. And outside our box, for all we know, is a box with everything in it. Yeah, exactly. uh, And we are the everything. Uh, the question literally becomes, and I don't mean to be funny, but it is, what's in the box? <laughs> and, yeah, it's literally what's And from in the, the box. point that the underlying question of the show, like the last two and a half episodes, is what's in the box... If you pay attention, like Departed style, there are so many box compositions, like a street sign that's shot from an it's angle where it becomes a boxes, box. Yeah. Or as well. there's tree branches at one point that have been pruned so that the negative space is a box of sky that sh- is shaped roughly mm. like the box that's in the middle of the of the gold cube. It's mm. just so cool in the air gapped, like gold room. It just looks. Awesome. There's a at one point there's a chandelier that has like swirling uh like arcs mm-hmm. all attached around a base like a uh, central uh origin uh in a sphere mm-hmm. and it looks exactly like the kind of uh collisions that you see that they they send out from like the large hadron collider and stuff like that when ah. they take a snapshot of a like a proton car crash kind I- of stuff there's a lot of those monolithic like Kind of in the same way that you're like you're mentioning Doctor Manhattan, uh, he cho- he chooses as his symbology the hydrogen atom. You mm-hmm. know, uh, it's it's to keep it very simple, holistic. Yeah, and one nucleus, one electron. S- scientifically base. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think because his ideas, his stories are so provocative. We kind of sleep on the fact that Alex Garland has one of the more consistent and impressive visual tones also. Like Mm. you wouldn't necessarily think of him as a Wes Anderson, but if he keeps this up, I can already see how literally the visuals of his films have a very distinct tone. Like if he were a graphic novelist, you would know one of his graphic novels on the shelf just by the art style. You'd be like, oh, that's a Hellboy, you know? (laughs) I actually think he's already there because he yeah. has such directorial, uh, he's such a directorial footprint um, at this point. Even though it's a small number of entries so far, it's not a, it's not a big bag of trick, tricks, but it's um, it's very tonally consistent, as you said. I think that's well said. He knows what he's um, about, dude. And it's yeah. not like Primer where their idea was trippy, but they're just doing their best to shoot a movie. He like he has yeah. visual ideas. <laughs> I did want to bring up something about uh, something you said about uh, the stiltedness of uh, the protagonist or the heroes of and his an story, annihilation. Tales. A lot of his stuff. Yeah, yeah sunshine as well. Um, Dread he worked with Boyle, definitely. Uh, and Boyle had that. He came he came up with Boyle, and Boyle does that. Um, but. <clears throat> I actually was vi- one of the more I don't think I've seen anything of recent recently that affected me as much as Lily's breakdown after she finds out that Ser- Sergey is dead. Uh, like I thought yeah. her performance there was 
top notch. I was not expecting it because I was expecting, like you said, you know, kind of just an ex machina approach to things mm-hmm. where it's just like everyone's a robot or but, a scientist. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or scientist. But she, her, like, her absolute, like, carnal scream and then the uh, way she just kind of turns from one second of absolute emotion to absolute shutdown because her body's just too tired to deal with it Mm -hmm. was just so evocative to me. So I think that he is very capable of, you know, uh, portraying characters driven by their emotions. I think he chooses not to. I agree. Because I think he wants, he thought, I think he thinks that, uh, I mean, look at Sunshine. Sunshine is a bunch of characters in a scenario where emotions could kill anything at any time. And so he chose to tell a story about like eight scientists who all think like, well, I I don't have anything to do right now, so I should just die. Because you have to do set off the bomb when we get to the sun. You have to keep the ship flying, and if anyone's going to get back, it uh, you need you know you need to actually fly the ship. But I'm the physicist. I don't need the bombs f- good and they don't <laughs> make know, a big like, emotional deal out of it. They just die. Yeah. So if we're looking at how many hours of oxygen we have left, I should just kill myself right now. Right. Right. Yes. Everyone agreed. Okay. Well, and his idea is these are the types of people that would actually make it to the point where they're on the forefront of human space missions is be people who would sphere, do anything yeah. from the mission. Yeah. <laughs> without exactly. Hesitating. They're like the scientific uh, grunts, yeah. you know, like even though they're not even the grunts cause they're highly intelligent, but from a standpoint, but of, I like, mean, most, most astronauts are hella patriotic. You've seen, yeah. uh, you know, even now, it's you know, like an astronaut would die for the mission, certainly, or, or that's the standard image of an astronaut. Uh, Did you want yeah. to talk at all about the? Uh, he chose very specifically biblical canon to talk about. Is there anything? Oh yeah, that was actually the last thing I wanted to make sure we got to before we wrapped up. Uh, I thought I. I thought I was the only one, but I guess it wasn't that subtle. So you, who should go? I wonder if we saw the same stuff. Cause I think there's, a I ton think of we awesome probably saw the same stuff. stuff. I had okay. some things where I was like, hmm, hmm Me I too. have a smarty pants. Me too, uh, but I guess so, we both had them. <laughs> but I'm sure there, everyone's thought of most of this stuff, but let's go through some of it. Sure. Yeah? Uh, do you want to go? You go. Cause well, I, just I only really talking. have Ha-ha. one, but it's like a system. It's the, uh, the, uh, it's the Garden of Eden because it's the yep. it's the white pillars of Silicon Valley with infinite money yep. and resources, totally sheltered lives. And by the way, Stuart and Lyndon fan art as those two characters from Venture Brothers that also live in a trailer together needs to happen. Mm. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Billy <laughs> Quiz boy, boy, boy oh, wonder, yeah. boy genius. And uh, Dr. <laughs> White or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's been so long. That was like 10 years ago. We man. should do a venture rewatch. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. I always wait for the series to actually. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Never, Bible, yeah. Bible. <laughs> um, so it's the Garden of Eden, <laughs> right? By, by accessing the knowledge that God has that you aren't supposed to have. You're, you think you'd have infinite power, but actually it makes Infinity life more knowledge. dangerous and depressing and grimmer and darker. And mm-hmm. you're out in the big chaotic world. And that is Lily fracturing the way the universe used to work. And now by observing the system, changing it, which is Eve biting into the apple. So now we're so women. <laughs> so now we're in, in a situation. I won't even say universe cause it encompasses the universe. <laughs> now we're in a situation where time was predeterministic, but she's Jesus in some sense and her existence caused it to become a multiverse at that point. And therefore the thing that I noticed that I was like, I'm a, I'm a smarty. This is why I have a movie (laughs) podcast is because I was like, that's cool. Just because that means ironically, Stuart's choice to murder someone, which he considered predestined is actually one of the very first free will conscious decisions ever made. And it's the choice to murder another human, which is the Cain and Abel story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's also a steward of the uh, predetermined. Stuart Ethan. is the steward yeah. of the earth. Yeah. Well, and I mean, then Kenton's the devil because Jesus Christ. Fuck that guy. That's actually, <laughs> that's actually really funny. Um, but he's not. He's not allegorically. I actually prefer yours to mine. I thought mine was a little bit 
a little too rudimentary because I kind of took it from their names and the fact that the ending resolves with them walking into this new simulation. Uh, Lily and Forrest are Adam and Eve. But they make the point that the camera is just cutting to a simulation that we're choosing right. to watch. Really, their identity has been split. It's become meaningless which one is the quote-unquote real them. As he exactly. said, there's also going to be infinite universes we could cut to where we're having a really awful time. Yeah, it's just now. everything now. <laughs> yeah. And we just got to happen to get a good one. This is great. We should enjoy it. Yeah. Which is much how and we all should operate with life, even if it were a simulation. All you can well, do is be grateful you for got, whatever you so got. So yeah, do the best, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's all a simulation. Okay. You know, like, right. That's fine. Or, but there uh, might be another universe where my loved one didn't die. All right. Mm -hmm. You still can't do anything about any of this. <laughs> yeah. See, I was thinking about, I got a little too into why he, because I think he always chooses his names very carefully. And I, like I actually thought that Sergey was um, Jesus because oh, I thought he that he dies was the martyr way. who had to die in order for all this to occur mm -hmm. for the message of and so God is like the machine God is reality and uh, they're Adam and Eve and the reason is because they kind of even though you could reverse the roles like it the gender is not specific because it doesn't really matter because right like, well you they both taste of the fruit of knowledge for a certain exactly does as well exactly you can see forest is the you know in the allegory of eve forest uh, is the eve know. really yeah yeah like honestly he sets it he's there's more of a case for that but i think that uh traditionally and in terms of biblical canon uh people are always going to make you know offerman the adam and her the eve just because the genders are that way um and i wish he did something a little bit more like that but that's also why i think we started the podcast saying it's more important that you ask like the fundamental questions instead of well i mean there's so far you could go he just chose his scope mm -hmm. right it's kind of arbitrary like yeah. if if in the true multiverse interpretation my understanding would be like there should be some universes where the chromosomes lined up differently in the wombs that right. they came from and nick offerman is a woman but the identity mm -hmm. is or you know what I mean, I don't even understand. Again, this all falls apart if you think about it too much, because let's say there's a universe where Nick Offerman, quote unquote, exists, but his different sequences of his DNA were turned on in conception than in this universe. Like, wouldn't there be many universes where every single person on Earth is different? Because thousands of years ago, they made it in a different configuration yeah, than an XYZ and there's universe. Yeah, we're all dinosaurs. Or there's we never evolved. Infinite. Right. And they just Once again, showed... infinite means unending. They it doesn't mean and like it means every, literally anything you could say. Yeah, Isn't there one where, so... yes, yes, there is. That's infinite. Isn't yeah, there one so... where they're all talking burgers? Yes. <laughs> But um, yes. uh, it's interesting. He just chose to cut to ones where they're still shaped like Nick Offerman and the had actress, their you know had their I mean? past yeah. almost identical. It's like, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, when people talk about cosmic time, the numbers get so big that it's like, yeah, we're just talking about the last second on the December of yeah. you know the thirty first. We could uh, just be looking at a narrow band in the spectrum right. of multiverses. They could think that their multiverse is the totality of existence and their multiverse could be a narrow band within a multiverse mm. of multiverses, which is a concept we can't even, doesn't even make which sense Which is what makes us. it so <laughs> yeah. uh, fascinating to talk about and frustrating. Uh, I thought that something was very specific about the names because they're the only names that spark of um, or smack of flora. Well, by the way, he's also made a thing called Deus because the last episode is Deus instead of Devs. And so he's also Machina. made Ex Machina. Yeah, so they, this is clearly a prequel, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> where they all come together. Uh, and they're all robots in a mm -hmm. multi-world simulation. <laughs> so Forrest, I couldn't help but say that Lily is a very specific object. Lily is a flower, right? Mm -hmm. Forrest is more of like a grouping of... Mm -hmm. um, a grouping of plants, I guess. So he's an trees. order of magnitude bigger on scale than she. Well, than her no, I think it are. comes from it comes from the strange biblical canon that uh, Eve was created out of Adam's rib. Oh, forest, and then Lily is a piece of a forest. Yeah, kind of thing. That's like cute. Adam, 
it's cute, but I just don't know why he chose those names. Some people talk about Lilith uh, being the uh, origin of uh, Lily, obviously. Mm -hmm. And this is probably more correct, is that Lilith was known as the first. It's not in canon for all religions, but uh, it was written about a lot. Um, Lilith was Jesus's first wife. And they show, they literally show the crucifixion. You're obviously mm-hmm. supposed to try and think of biblical Well, that's allegories. why we're talking about yeah, all yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And they literally are in a garden and it uh, has to deal with knowledge, mm-hmm. the, like, forsa- like forsaken or forbidden knowledge. But I love um, how like even in Annihilation, it could be a full on dry exercise like an upstream color, which yeah. I would still love because I love shit like that. But you know what I mean? Even in Annihilation, he knew he had to get a rainbow alligator and a scare bear in there. I love that in this, mm-hmm. he's like, my interest is primarily the heady, trippy stuff. But, uh, you know, I am going to have this guy torture and stalk and murder people. That's fun, right? right. It gets the adrenaline going. And dude, yeah. when he wants to execute an action scene, he can't. Kenton fighting in the parking garage i'm like i want this motherfucker to get it so bad and the fact that he wins anyway you're like why can't we stop this pudgy 55 year old dude right i think (laughs) i think it had to deal with like the pudgy 55 year oldness that i was like i felt like i was watching breaking bad i was like this motherfucker's hard. And then also, (laughs) he's gotta he's gotta die he's gotta die you gotta die kenton yeah, For all we you know, your first name him. is Steve. You gotta die, Steve. You gotta die, Steve. Well, <laughs> it all smacks back to Deadwood, which Nick Offerman was in. Um, was he? Yeah, you didn't know? Wait, who is he in Deadwood? Nick Offerman. Just like a random in, trapper uh, episode- from the woods or something? Yeah, uh, yeah, he's in season one as one of the brothers. Uh, fucking what's his name? Tom. The, the guy who's like a fucking idiot at the beginning who like they they like stole the um, Sophie, the arc that starts the Sophie arc, the, um, the young girl where oh, they, like, okay. admit, they make it seem like native Americans. Right, right, right. Took him. He's one of the brothers. So he's the brother of the idiot who did mm-hmm. that plan. And then he shows up and then we realize that, Oh, they're all kind of in on the plan. And they get an so, OFT out of town. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and he, and uh, if you remember, he Nick Offerman plays the guy where he busts into Al Swearingen's office with his fucking dick in his hand, going like, "Oh man, Al, thanks," because Al was like, uh, "Why don't you go have sex with some people while I determine what to do with you?" And can we uh, confirm is that Nick Offerman's penis? No, I think it's probably prosthetic. Nick Offerman. I mean, if it was his penis, penis, very well endowed. <laughs> Image results for Nick Offerman penis. I don't know why we're doing settings this. tools. Where is it? Check Safe it search. Out. Do not filter explicit results. Um. Well, I'm seeing a bunch of images of him. <laughs> yeah, that looks Penises. real. Of him pissing with his bare dick while flipping off camera straight up into the air, but it has nothing to That's do not with. It. Deadwood? It says it's part of a not safe for work music video. Yeah, Nick Offerman hangs dong in a music video. Really? Yeah, watch Nick Offerman in this new not safe for work Fiddler music video, and it's just that is bizarre. him whipping his dick out and peeing incredibly forcefully at the sky while he scowls and flips it off. Ten out of ten, do recommend. <laughs> <laughs> ten out of ten. Uh, yeah, but if you were to search. Deadwood Nick Offerman, you'll see, you'll see. He also gets shot by Wild Bill. True. Which I yeah. mean, any of us would be honored to go that way. Abe. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I know it's only an audio format, but I'm about to send you an image of Nick Offerman's penis in the Discord, and oh, I'd cool. like you to re- react to it in real time. Okay. I mean, I I open it up. There we are. Mm-hmm. 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 How's that? Is that good you know, for you? He's got kind of an early Elvis look going on. He's got a. He's really. <laughs> it's like a rain stick. I, I don't know how to react to this other than, uh, yes, yeah, dude, yeah, dude, <laughs> yeah, it's dude. warm like a baguette. 
Uh, I haven't. Se- I think I've seen this image before. I mean, that penis. That is one's shopped. Like, but so, that music for, yeah, video that is one's real. Shopped. That that yeah. is the size of an upper torso. <laughs> All right. So now you know. Um, that's what we <laughs> what thought we of devs. We really time. liked it, or we wouldn't be covering it. We love mm-hmm. you. We're thankful for your patronage, um, and we will release this as a bonus content. And Nick Offerman's penis can be viewed online. Confirmed. I didn't expect mm-hmm. that. It's great. It's great. It's great. So I'm going to release this on Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so also, if you're listening to this one, the day of coming out, uh, feel free to join us uh, tomorrow. We're going to be st- live streaming uh, some Jackbox games. Oh, yeah. Who all And so and you should come that. to that. And that's just a yeah. thank you fans for being fans. <clears throat> you're stuck inside thing. Mm -hmm. And if you want more details, just go to our Patreon or uh, check us out at uh, either of our um, Twitters. Oh, yeah, that's better. The Mighty. Then they have to go to the site. I'm Swaim underscore Corp. Um, But for the record, yeah, a lot of big names joining us to play stupid games. And you'll get to vote on what games we play and winners and stuff like that. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, it'll be a nice self-isolation comedy few hours. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited about it. It's going to be fun. Uh, it's gonna be fun. So look at that. Look at that tomorrow, and uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Anything else, Michael? No. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. It can end like that. <laughs> Devs. Devs. <laughs> This has been a small beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash small beans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash small beans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you.